Hi, everybody. My name is Jen Paffenroth. Um, I'm the administrator here at IEC Thermo. Welcome to the second episode of our Webinar Wednesday series. Um, we're glad to see some of you are back that joined us last week as well. If you were not able to see last week's webinar um, about hemp drying basics, definitely take a look at it as it takes an in-depth look at hemp drying with lots of key takeaways. Um, you can check it out on our YouTube channel, IEC Thermo. Next week, our topic will be centered around Tech Week, so we'll be on, so be on the lookout for that invite, which will be shared on our Instagram and our faith, Facebook. Um, and then at the end of today's webinar, Drew and Matthew will spend some time answering questions. So feel free to leave questions in the Q&A section, which is kind of at the bottom of your Zoom screen and we will get to answering them at the end of the presentation. Thanks for joining us, and I'll turn it over to you, Drew. Well, thank you. Yeah, welcome everybody today. Uh, we have a great opportunity to show you a little highlight about our dryer system, and first I wanna welcome folks. We've got, uh, I know of at least five states that are actually getting ready to, to grow and harvest uh, hemp for the first time in 2020. I know Iowa, Ohio, Georgia, Florida, and Texas are all uh, finally getting a chance to get their feet wet in the temp industry and uh, shout out to those folks. I know we've got some people who are tuning in uh, from those states and welcome. I would encourage you to educate yourself as much as possible uh, regarding this industry. Uh, you probably already did your research on the seed side of things and how to plant. If not, get cracking because time's a wasting. <laughs> but uh, there, uh, as Jen alluded to, we have a great resource on just the aspects of drying. It's not specific to our dryer itself, but the reason why people would want to dry their hemp. It's a great educational tool, and I'd encourage you to learn as much as you can about this industry because it is a, a new industry and is growing very fast. Um, with that, uh, we have uh, what I have today. We have two different uh, shows or events. We have a PowerPoint that we're going to go through, a slideshow that will kind of give you an idea, an overview, if you will, of our dryer. And it is kind of like a brochure you would receive at our um, trade shows. The fact that we can't travel and, and the trade shows aren't happening, of course, because the coronavirus is, has changed our narrative a little bit. So instead of getting to meet people face to face, we're doing what we're doing today, which actually is quite exciting. And then what we're doing... Um, uh, and then the second part of that show is what we're doing is a, a video and the video it comprises a, as a video from my phone that I, we took and created a movie if you will that kind of walks around each component of the dryer system and we'll pause that and talk about in, in depth about each component to help you get an understanding and appreciation for uh, what we're doing and how we go about our process of drying hemp. Typically we would have open houses where you'd actually be able to come in and see the, the dryer in person. And I spoke with the gentleman that, that, ho that we host a lot of these at. And um, if things relax here, like we're hoping they will, uh, and people would feel safe and secure enough, he feels fine, as long as we social distance, uh, coming and looking at the dryer again. So we might be able to resume some of that operation down the road. So if that's something you guys are interested, by all means, we'll reach out to us. But uh that's all i've got at the moment before we start matthew do you have any other comments uh no i just say my name is matthew clark i do a lot of the uh, documentation and all that kind of fun stuff for IEC. so um i have written the manuals and things that go along with this and so just kind of here to help um drew describe some of the details of iec last week we talked a lot about drying in general and and this week we'll talk a lot about uh what makes the iec system work and different Sure. Well, thank you. Um, some of the basics of hemp drying, uh, and you'll notice if you look and do research on, on dryers for hemp, you'll see most of them fall into one of two categories. You'll see uh, the basic design is like a uh, rotary drum type drying, uh, a dryer system. And what you'll see that that's, that is usually a we found in like, uh, let's see, like mining applications and you find it in asphalt and, and that type of stuff. It, that, that kind of drying technique has been used for many years. Uh, probably uh, it, uh, it's, you see that type of dryer system. And then the other type of dryer system you see is a, a conveyor box system that looks kind of like a shipping container, if you will, that has some, has some kind of conveyors or belt system where hemp will come in and, 
and dry that. And I'll speak a little bit to the pros and cons of both of those types. And then I'm going to highlight today the way we dry hemp. And the way we dry hemp is a little different. Either one of those, uh, we have a unique system of drying hemp uh, that actually we have a patent pending now on our design. So it's kind of neat to have the, be recognized for that technology and, and the means of which we dry hemp. Uh, so let's go, we'll go forward with the video or the uh, PowerPoint here. And this just gives an overview of each component or each drying system as we go through it. Next slide, please, Jen. So we also have our hemp dryers and hemp stands for high efficiency multi-phase dryer. In our system, we have actually, a, it's a two-phase system. We have a flash dryer system and then that dovetails into a fluid bed system that, dry, that finishes the drying. And I'll talk to the greater detail of each of those as we travel through the day here. But the key part of this is that we, we, we use some established drying components uh, and techniques, as well as some uh, unique processes that help save and keep that cannabinoid molecule intact and undamaged. We run at a, a very quick pace. Our, our dryers run from start to finish. You can see a, a hemp entering the, the dryer and about 90 seconds later, it's out the backside dried or down to less than 10% moisture content. I'll touch on that a few, in, in more greater detail. Um, that's part of the efficiency is, I look at it as, um, it, you're, everyone's familiar with a, a frozen TV dinner and how they, lock, and like Swanson's was, I think the first to lock in this flash frozen deep meal that really sealed in the freshness and the, and the taste and the flavor. The same idea with flash drying is we really quickly lock in those molecules and, and stabilize that biomass so that it is uh, ready and stable to be used for extraction or whatever process we're going to go after post drying. So the idea is when you harvest, you want to stabilize your crop as possible. And that's why we do hemp the way we do hemp. We go very, very quick, very efficient. And speaking of that, the importance of that is it stops molding and mildew. And, and if you see hemp last, it's kind of like lawn clippings. If you sit it in a big pile, let it sit for any length of time, it'll outgas and become wet and, and can quickly start to decompose rather quickly. And that just starts to affect your CBD and other cannabinoids out there. <laughs> Next slide, please. Yeah, that's an important point, Drew. I think uh, unlike a lot of other agricultural commodities, the hemp plant really does have chemical processes that start as soon as you harvest. So having a process in place to stop those by removing the moisture uh, as soon as possible is really important. Absolutely agree with you on that. Thank you. Um, so why drive the IEC dryer? Uh, like I said, we dry down, we can dry below 10% moisture content. Uh, typically uh, with your harvest levels, we see uh, like last year was uh, for us, uh, particularly in the Midwest, we saw really a strange season. We saw a very wet, early spring that caused a lot of problems of getting crop in the field and then we had a period where it was a drought and so it just went the totally opposite and then come harvest time boom it came back to being a very wet season again and so we had when you try when it, when hemp comes on and you need to dry it i need to get it harvested quickly it's an all-in proposition you go 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 until it's done and gone and that's one of the strengths of our dryer system it's meant to be continuously flowing and running the entire time so as long as you want to stay and man the, the dryer, the dryer is there to keep drying your crop. <clears throat> um, with that and said, the, we're gentle and low, uh, low temperature operations. It's, it's a two-step two process where we dry hemp, but in the meantime, in between that period is actually cooling back down. So we never achieve, uh, uh, the biomass never gets above 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is, keep in mind, we are drying hemp from, from right out of the field to into a super sack or tote uh, in around 90 seconds time. So we're taking something that is very wet and, and uh, free flowing and discreet that comes right out of the, the field. And we are turning around and having a dry product on the back end. And if you're worried about decarbing your, your hemp, that is a process where it's a combination of heat and time that that when you sit in, a, in it for a longer period, it will start to decarb. We are moving at such a fast pace, at such a low temperature, there's no chance for any kind of decarb. So we're very gentle on the molecules, which is very important. Um, yeah, I think that's an important point here is that, you know, when this system was designed, it was designed with 
hemp and specifically protecting cannabinoids in mind. So we use that two-stage process so that we can remove a lot of the moisture with the first part, but then be much more gentle with the fluid bed and, uh, and really provide that quick speed, but also the low temps and then predict, which protects the cannabinoids. Absolutely. One of the other advantages we have with our dryer is we have a customizable layout and you'll see the way the flash dryer portion of this dryer works versus the fluid bed. It allows some great flexibility because what connects the two is the flash dryer is what connects the, the two um, parts together and you'll see how we are able to ad address or change or modify to fit in various buildings. Um, uh, you'll see the pictures, like in this picture below here, you'll see the a, a picture of the, actually it's our, I call it our skunk works. That's where we do our open houses currently. And you'll see the two large cyclones. Those large cyclones uh, vary. That's our 3000 model that you see in front of you. That's our small one, that's our baby. And those are 25 foot tall uh, cyclones. Those cyclones can be placed outside with a little bit of modification so that we don't have to necessarily have the ceiling height in place to make uh, to accommodate your building. So uh, I can honestly say, I think last year we had a couple dozen dryers we, we have uh, sold and, and installed and not a single one was the same. And that's because that speaks to our availability and customizability of our layouts. So there's a lot of flexibility built into the design to allow us to accommodate your existing building if need be, or if you have a, um, a purpose-built building, it's, it's a great way to accommodate and maximize your, your space, especially a protected indoor space. Um, another key part is the labor and square footage required is greatly reduced. Um, obviously labor, I, we're looking at to run this dryer system, you're, you're using like a four-man crew three, four man crew, maybe as many as five, depending on how busy you're, you're going and how quick you're going. But um, much far different from people who are trying to hang dry and that, that kind of stuff. That's just way, way too labor intensive. And for the volume that we're trying to achieve here, it's gonna be hard pressed to do much more than what the three or four guys that are working here on our dryer system can do. It's, it's pretty impressive how quickly we can dry hemp. And then the last feature I think is, is just as important as anything is, um, we're based out of the Midwest, uh, where we had an office in Rockford, Illinois, uh, and predominantly most of our equipment is manufactured in and around the Milwaukee area. So we're in the Midwest and we can, we can ship either coast up in Canada and down to Mexico really quite easily. So being centrally located is great. And the fact that it's all made in the United States is a feather in our cap. We're proud of that fact. And then the components you see are very heavy gauge steel, very durable, meant to last a generation. I mean, they're, they're really solid. Um, and, and that speaks to the quality and build quality of, of the things that were built here by our U.S. workers. So uh, that's all I've got yeah, on this side. Anything absolutely. I mean, like you said, this is a continuous flow equipment that's uh, agricultural in use, but industrial in design and that it's meant to run 24-7 <clears throat> so that you can really uh, maximize your opportunity to dry within your you know, harvest time and then, uh, you know, take bale material in the off season. Perfect. Next slide, please. All right. This is the, this is a schematic, a basic overview of the dryer system itself. And you can see to the left is a flash dryer furnace. And then to the right of that is the metered feed hopper. And then the flash dryer cyclone, those break up the flash dryer portion of the, of the multi-phase hemp dryer. Uh, the other uh, backside we'll talk about, that's the, that's the final stages. But um, in a nutshell, those are the main components. What is not, you're not seeing on here are actually the fans. There's some large fans that help drive the whole system. And, and we'll touch on that as we go on. Next slide, please. This one is very important. We cannot stress enough the importance of the feed. The feed is the key. And, and with that being said, when you look at the, uh, the components uh, and, and how we dry and the speed at which we dry, it's important we have an optimal size uh, biomass. What we need is, and require is a discrete free-flowing biomass that is approximately four mesh in size, which is about a quarter inch. And what that does is that allows us to, to dry the hemp extremely quick. Um, and we take that moisture content that is 70% or greater and reduce that to less than 10% 
in that 90 second period, uh, 90 second time frame. Um, the, the feed size can be achieved during the harvest or with additional sizing in a tub grinder, hammer mill, or combination of the two. And we actually have some uh, design things that we're going to talk about later on when we go do the video that I'll explain a little bit more as well and, and some updates we did to this year's dryer design. Uh, the proper feed size and conditioning allows for rapid release of moisture and this is it helps create that really short dwell time in our dryer system and that really stabilizes like I say the CBD and cannabinoids. What happens is this flash dryer and, and you can see in the next slide if you would Jen. Thank you. You can see the, these large fans. These, these fans are, uh, and, and I should also iterate that our models of our dryers, they're all identical in, as far as components and the way they work, the engineering and design philosophies behind them are all identical. What we have is a small, medium, and large, or actually an extra large, we, didn't, we skipped the large. And what that and so we what we did is we we have a design that works very very well and efficiently on drying the hemp and so we scaled it to meet the demand for the throughput that is needed in this industry and that's why we have three different size dryers. Um, the fans that drive that really were a key to the component of this and make this work are they also scale in size and so we're running a lot a lot more uh, volume of air as we scale up because we're adding more biomass through the system. What we have in our, with the, with the fans, we have three large fans, two are induction fans. And for you who don't know what an induction fan is, if you have a box fan and you're standing in front of it, that is blowing on you. And that's that we call a blower or a blower fan. If you're standing on the back side of that, out of the breeze, and you, you feel the air being pulled through, that's the induction side of things. And that what that does is it dry, creates a, a, a suction. So if you were to duct that box fan you've got and put a duct on the back side of that fan, you would see and feel the air being pulled through. Well, that's what we do. That's how we move our hemp around. And that's how we move it around such a quick speed and how we dry it so efficiently is the fact that we have induction fans that pull the hemp through the whole system. And it'll become more apparent as we talk about the burners. Um, this yeah, that's what I always like to say. I mean, uh, part of the reason we were able to keep the low temperatures and the time is the material literally never stops moving within the system. And that material, I mean, in the initial duct run is going about 50 miles an hour. So these are some very powerful fans that provide that mix of air and heat that with the right feed that we were talking about can allow you to really efficiently dry. Absolutely right. Yep. Uh, that's what makes it such a difference. And then, of course, because we're pulling and bringing and mixing that warm air in with, the, with your hemp, you don't have, uh, is never in, in direct contact with the open flame and you don't have excessive heat and so it's it's controlled in a variety of ways and I'll we'll point that out as we go through and describe in better details the components probably in the, the video portion of this presentation but um, and because we mix with air and we drive the whole thing is driven with air it's it's constantly it's very turbulent so it's constantly mixing and drying and evaporating your um, moisture content out of the dryer uh, I mean, in the dryer, it, it's modifying that and, and pulling that heat out. So we have a real consistent product. So we don't have any, have any wet or hot spots. We don't have uh, parts that aren't dried properly. It's because the entire process is, it's in the equal the same heat. So it's, it's a, and, and same, same amount of air quality. So we dry, the whole biomass is going to be dried sim the same, regardless of where it's at. And that's due to the size of the, um, the chop or, or the, the sizing of the biomass. That's, that's really the magic in the system. And most other dryer systems, uh, they too would probably sing the praises of wanting to have the feed as the key. And, and the fact that that's how you get your efficiencies and how, how you can dry very well. It's a lot easier to dry uh, little flakes of hemp versus sticks and uh, pencil size and big nuggets and, and the what have you, because that just, you, you can't effectively dry that quickly like we do. On to the next slide, please, Jen. So here's phase one. This is the, the flash dryer phase. You can see we're going to talk about the flash dryer, it's, uh, the flash dryer furnace, the metered feed hopper, and the flash dryer cyclone. The metered feed hopper is where we introduce the hemp to the system. And what that does, it has a feed hopper up top, and then there is a, a auger that we have uh, control of that absolutely perfectly dials in the amount of biomass that's introduced into the 
uh, dryer. So that's key to achieving your efficiencies and getting your volume that you want uh, is having a consistent metered flow of hemp into the dryer system. Now that's where the wet hemp that comes out of your field, that fresh harvested hemp comes in there. What happens if you look to the left, you see the flash dryer furnace. Induction fans are on the opposite side of this, this system. And what it's doing is you see the ductwork that runs that flash dryer furnace. That's where we're pulling our air is being pulled through that furnace. You'll see portholes in a moment. You'll see the, dry, uh, the flash furnace. You'll see portholes where air is being pulled through, mixed with warm, with the, the flame create, creating a hot gaseous uh, mixture. And then we're flashing it when this hemp is introduced at this, the point where the intersection on the, the ductwork. And that ductwork is actually where the, at that, that point, that union right there is actually the flash part of the flash dryer. And that ductwork is where is critical to the dwell time in, in having our hemp dry as quickly and efficiently as we do. And speaking to that, Matthew touched on it, the airspeed in that, that first critical phase, we hit it with a high temperature. And what that does is it, it immediately is that biomass is brought in. We knock the, the moisture content of that biomass uh, uh, almost 40% uh, gets knocked out. We see if you're running that 70% moisture content uh, up front uh, as it's coming out of the field, you could see uh, 38 to 45% moisture content as it hits the, as it comes out of the flash dryer cyclone. And that's short, short period of time. You're talking about a second dwell time. So this is not a standing start from zero to 40 miles an hour. This is, this is a constant 40 mile an hour wind you're basically putting the hemp and warm air into. And that it's important that people get caught up on the flash part of it and that we're hitting with the high heat. Well, that high heat, the moment it hits with that wet hemp, it dissipates very, very quickly. You're no longer at a high, very high temperature, approximately 700 degrees. It instantaneously drops down in the 200s and it continues to cool as it comes back in here. And we never, ever get the biomass, never gets a chance to heat up. It's, it's exposed to this for just a second, literally one second. Yeah, and it's not direct heat, right? It's the mixing of the heat in the air. As it drops into that pipe there, it doesn't even, there's not a heated element it lands on. It just literally starts mixing with the heated air. So, and then it never stops moving from that point forward. So that's why we're able to maintain those temps. Uh, and, Thank you know, you. I was just yeah, going to yeah. add, obviously, for most of you that are following along, this is, this is a dryer that's designed for biomass and a chopped type material. So we would never tell you to put, you know, whole flour into something like this. Um, but we could also talk to you or you could take a look at our other webinar where we do kind of talk about um, some of the options for that kind of dryer. Perfect. Absolutely right. Next slide, Jen. Okay, so here's the flash dryer. And, and what you see, you, you see some components that you see the, the idea of what a good chop is. Uh, and then to your right, far right, you see the, the union of that conveyor belt that goes up and there's what we call the lift tube or a J tube. It resembles kind of the letter J. And that's the union where the actual flash of the flash dryer is introduced. That's where the warm heat is coming from the um, furnace and is being introduced with the hemp. And then from that, the stainless steel, you see a, um, uh, the, spiral stainless steel ductwork, it's from that point on is where the, the drying happens in a very, very quick pace. In the middle, you see that we're looking at the backside of the burner. So we're looking actually at the burner that is in the furnace itself. And you can see we have a very short, compact, white, blue flame that I always say, and it, it still impresses me, it looks and feels like a F-14 with afterburners. So you Top Gun fans, you can get one of these for your dryer. It is uh, something that you see, uh, the key is the mixing of that air and that heat to combine the inaccurate temperature that goes in and creates this flash drying experience. So all of this happens within literally one second. So it's, it's a very, very quick, very effective way to quickly knock down that moisture and start the drying process. And just to kind of go back to the feed for a second, another thing we really found this sh coming out of last year and, and researching this year is, is really the benefit of a secondary grind going into the flash dryer for our system. Um, you know, people are harvesting in a lot of different ways, but hemp has its own sort of uh, properties. And so understanding that, like Drew mentioned, it has a tendency to clump and do a lot of these things. Um, we found running it through a, a hammer mill after being, you know, um, harvested in the field with something like a forge chopper or a, or a combine, you would put that through a secondary grind and that kind of helps 
uh, remove a lot of the fiber issues that you have and really kind of fluff up the material to let the pre-dryer do its job. Yeah, absolutely right. And that also, it keeps a real homogenous looking uh, biomass. So uh, you'll see it, it becomes more discrete and free flowing, which is critical to our ability to dry hemp as quick as we dry hemp. Next slide, please, Jen. On to phase two. Now, the first phase you saw, that happens literally the, from the time hemp enters in the dryer to the time it, it hits that cyclone, uh, one second. So, I mean, and we, we tout we can dry this in 90 seconds or about 90 seconds time. So, you, know, you can see the first, fat, first play is a flash. That first phase is very, very, very quick. The second phase is where it dwells a little bit longer, but it's important. It's critical what we do here. We're at much lower heat and for a little bit longer time but that's how we achieve our, our efficiencies in drying hemp. And so with phase two, you see the components that go into that are the fluid bed, the fluid bed cyclone, and then we have, we're including what's gonna be a pneumatic conveyor, which I'll talk to later, and then the fluid bed furnace, which is actually the, we have two fans on this last process. We have a blower fan, which is the fluid bed uh, furnace, and that is actually gonna be pushing air and, and then we have an uh, induction fan on the back, on the top of the cyclone that's actually drawing air, that's pulling air through the fluid bed. And I'll explain to you or, or, and detail a little bit more about the, what the fluid bed goes through. So what happens is as the cyclone, uh, most cyclones are identical in function and, what the, and size, and what they do is they separate the, the solids from the air mat, the warm, moist air, and it's like a... Uh, Dyson vacuum cleaner and Dyson would like to think that have you think that they invented the the cyclone effect on, on dryers but the, the cyclones have been around for a hundred years and there's nothing special about ours either other than they're very very efficient and so what happens is we can separate the warm moist air out the top and then uh, the solids collect in the bottom of the, of the cyclone and then we have an airlock in the bottom that paddles out and drops and maintains a vacuum, but it allows uh, biomass to drop onto a conveyor. From that conveyor, it goes into the fluid bed. And we'll go ahead with the next slide, Jen, and we'll start with a. So here with the fluid bed, uh, this is where real low, low temperature, uh, and it combined with the uh, huge volumes of air and biomass is what re re uh, reduces the rest of the, uh, and dries the moisture content out of your hemp. Um, what you see here, and it's, it's I, I now realize, and the, the challenge here is we're doing stuff, streaming your bandwidth might be a little different, and it might be a little more apparent when we go into the video portion of this, but uh, you can see to the left, you see our, um, the static slide of, of uh, what the fluid bed looks like. The fluid bed is nothing more than a round cylinder that's got, it's got two cavities. There's a, a, a plenum that is the bottom part, and that is where the warm air from the, um, fluid bed furnace is actually pushing warm air through underneath and then what divides that cylinder our fluid bed in place is a, is a flat table that has a series of small holes and I always relate it to and a lot of people identify that it's like air hockey table uh, you know remember air hockey you had uh, when when it's unplugged and you're trying to knock that puck around it doesn't move very quickly but when you add air to it boy it lifts that and really makes that uh, hockey experience go very quickly. The same goes on with what our, what's happening in our fluid bed. A lot of people think fluid bed relates to some kind of water or a wet source of some sort. That's actually it refers to the way that the biomass is behaving inside this uh, co container. What you see in the middle is you'll see it looks like a, a, a swarm of bees that are buzzing around. Actually that is the particle size of the hemp being dancing around inside the dryer in this fluid bed and, and what happens is as it comes in and I'll mind you we went from 70 percent moisture content down to the uh, say low 40s moisture content now it's being brought into the fluid bed and the fluid bed is where it's going to finish the um, the drying process and now it's going to be it, what is happening is it is being suspended in air so you got warm dry air circulating right quite quickly around this biomass and it's drying it. And as it dries, the biomass will actually lose its weight. As it loses its weight, it's being pulled by the induction fan up through the top of the cyclone, and, or it's up through the top of the fluid bed, rather, and brought into the cyclone where it'll be metered and feed and, and taken off and, and uh, ready for uh, super sacks or your totes. So uh, on to the next slide, if you would, please, Jen. 
So some of the points, and we've talked about it uh, a little bit about the features of our drawing, and you see the video, and the the video is actually hemp coming out of the back of our, our system as it's dried. It's been, right now it looks like it's going into food grade quality plastic bags that are in a tote, but you see how that works. And then the upper right, you'll see the other is a, an example of outdoor components. So you can see where we have the induction fans, or those are the, the pulleys and and the fans themselves that are with the yellow and blue on the ground and then it has this stack this large stack for exhaust stack and then you can see the cyclones are mounted outside too and this is for this was the large facility in eastern illinois that the, they had an existing building but didn't have the ability to, uh, to accommodate those cyclones and this is for six thousand so this is a larger unit so you're looking at i think approximately 35 feet tall cyclones and so we are obviously flexible in our design. We were able to put that outside and what you see is the backside of that, that uh, system. Uh, as you said, we're quick on the drying time. Uh, critical to this is we really don't have that many moving parts. Uh, the components in our dryer system, they don't, the, the moving parts are electric motors, which are all under VFDs. And I'll touch on that a little bit later as well. But the, pretty much we have three fans we have a variety of, uh, of real simple basic electric motors that are driving uh, two conveyor belts and uh, uh, and then we have one for the auger, it's uh, input feed hopper. Uh, not much, many moving parts, We're, most of it is being driven with the air and the fans that create that. And the fans uh, have a, a, a very durable, very industrial, uh, it's amazing the size of these fans too. Um, so then we are very quick and, and as we said, and then we're also gentle and low temperatures. The key with our, with our biomass is we hit it with a, a flash it with a, a high heat, but it, and now all that does start to warm up the biomass. We never get above 140. And as it goes through the system, it actually comes into the cyclones. It loses temperatures, goes through the cyclone, and then it, it's introduced into the fluid bed. And then there, that's where it finishes drying at a much lower temperature. And then it's, it's over with at that point, you got a less than 10% moisture content biomass coming out the back end, which is on a conveyor or actually we're looking at, I'll give, a, give it away, uh, updated for 2020. We have some new updates and designs, which I'll talk in detail about also uh, a little bit later. And one of those is a pneumatic conveyor system on the backside, which is pretty important. So uh, next slide, if you would, please, Jen. Now this is important in what you're seeing here is uh, the, the first hexagon you see that's got, it's kind of dancing around is a little, and it's got some animated uh, uh, wheels and gears going around and flames dancing. That is part of our advanced programmable logic controller and uh, part of the motor control center. And what is neat about our system is that we have uh, a single start button and so everything will pot, file up, fire up, excuse me, in sequence. And so you don't have to worry about this on, then that, and that, and remembering what sequence it is. It's all programmed, so it all introduces there's checkpoints in place. So one in, one thing will not start till the other is met its, is in operating condition and, and, and right and optimum. And so what you see is it's very easy to start and get going with it. It has it features a large 15 inch uh, color touchscreen uh, that's easy to see from a distance, and that's critical for when you're working. And I'll touch on some more details. That. And then we have this remote camera monitoring and support. Uh, it'll be more obvious when we get to the second part of the video, we'll see that in better detail. And then we have e-stops uh, located around the dryer. It's important that when you got this large machinery and, uh, and help moving through, if there's anything going on as the operators, whatever it takes, we want to be able to stop the equipment quickly and easily. And so there's emergency shutoffs uh, located uh, in a variety of places on the dryer. So it's critical to be able to stop that at a point. And the upper right then you'll see, which is our inside our cabinet for the motor control center. And I'll, I'll talk in more detail about that uh, during the video part of that. Uh, next slide, please, thank you. Here we're seeing our capacities. And this is, this is get, give you an idea, of scale, and this is what's lost in the translation here uh, about doing this virtually. When you're standing in front of the dryer, and even our small dryer, you'll get a real sense quickly the size and scale of the, of the equipment we have. Um, and so when you get to see these capacities, you get a feel for some of the, the rates and size and, and what is involved to be able to dry as efficiently as we do. And so 
we have, like I said, we have three dryer sizes. We have a 3,000, 6,000, 15,000. And our capacities uh, with the green biomass, the rates, feed rates, you can see up to 3,000 uh, pounds an hour. Uh, uh, this is wet pounds an hour, our harvested material an hour. So up to 6,000 of the 6,000, of course, there's 15, it's 15,000. So you can see we, we went from a 3,000, doubled it to a 6,000. And then, like I said, we skipped the large. We went right to extra large. We went three times the size of our small dryer. And so when you stand next to these things, it's the big equipment. On to the next slide, Jen. Here you see, and this is just as important, is the, um, this gives you appreciation for what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, and you can see the different models we have. Uh, we, what we require is a three phase 440 electricity supplied to the system. And you can see the size of the horsepower and electrical thing. Uh, the, the belts and uh, the, the two conveyor belts and the auger and the other little incidental uh, electrical motors don't take up a whole lot. Where the bulk of the electricity is being consumed is in the three large fans. We're talking some horsepower here. Uh, you can see we're talking 220 horses on the, on the small, all the way up to 800 horses on the large, on the large dryer. That's because we're moving a crazy amount of air through the system. That's how we can drive as fast as we can. And then we have a dual, um, dual source or, or uh, ignition source or, or fuel, if you will, that we can accommodate. Uh, uh, there's advantages and disadvantages to both. Uh, the thing about the natural gas is it's, it's, it's a little, it's cheaper. To, uh, right now, it's probably really cheap with the way the price, gas prices are, or in both cases. But um, if you have a natural gas service, you can see that that's the, that rate is per hour. So we, we're using 8,000 gallons per hour in the 3,000 uh, all the way up to 40,000 per hour in the big daddy of the 15. Uh, and then the LP, the liquid propane, um, we, have, we have, do have quite a few dryers that use that as well. Uh, that is, you can see the, the rate at which we, those are cubic foot per hour is the rate that we use uh, this uh, LP gas. And our goal is that the BTUs per hour, and that's that's really the key is to have a system that's robust enough that can meet the demands of, of hemp. And and what you see as you harvest hemp, the changes in um, the moisture content of hemp can change quickly from day to day, even within the day, you'll see it change. Uh, so you can see hemp uh, sometimes. Sometimes you get lucky with the dry spells when it's time to harvest and you can see lows in the uh, upper 50s, 60s. Or if you live in an environment where it is um, drier, a lot of times if you're irrigating, you can shut the irrigation off ahead of time and let that plant dry out a little bit, it reduce that moisture as it matures. And, and then you could be in an area where it's very, I know our folks in Florida, it's the critical part to, to sustaining your crops is to be able to have a, 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 the ability to dry quickly. And that's why we use the huge amount of uh, BTUs per hour to, to do that. Uh, below that you see our minimum footprint. Uh, this is just a design guide that allows you to um, look at the size of uh, consideration for the size of the building. The last value, the, the height, the, the 25 foot, the 35 foot, and 45 foot, those refer to the overall height of the cyclones. And as stated, we can, uh, the flexibility of our design allows us to move those cyclones outside. Now, um, of the 15,000s we've sent, we've sold, we, not, not a one has got a building that is uh, 45 feet tall that we can slide one in. So those have been outside and our 6,000s, by and large, uh, we do have a, a couple dryers that actually have large ceilings and we have a, a, a 6,000 in, all inside, but those a lot of times are included and are outside and it just, it makes sense. It's practical on that end. And then you can see the shipping weights, the basic, those are just bulk shipping weights on the, some of the components. Um, uh, and that yeah, includes and our just like you said, um, you know, this kind of breaks down some of the requirements. We've run into seeing folks um, have issues being able to get some of the service upgrades that they really need at the sites they're considering. So it's important that you do think about these things ahead of time and also think that um, these really are commercial jobs. So when you're looking for an electrician or a, a plumber to hook up your gas lines and stuff, you're going to want to make sure you have somebody that has the right kind of experience. Uh, to do this big of a job. Absolutely, Matthew, and thank you for bringing that up. You're right. Um, in the, if you were to uh, purchase a, a dryer, the typical scenario with that is 
you'd meet with one of our sales team members, we would uh, get the uh, process in, in place and going and introduce you to our project manager. Uh, every, every site gets their own project manager that will manage and help guide the details of your dryer and help guide you in the process of setting up. We won't do the um, general contracting on your site for your building or for the electrical components or the gas components of that. That's something that each local entity would have to address themselves. And the reason being is we're not, in no way could we be aware of all the various building codes that are required. Uh, we found a variety as we sold dryers all over the nation. Some places were uh, some of the things you have to consider uh, out when you're putting cyclones outside is the wind load. And there's one place in particular that has notorious has a three month period of really high sustained winds. So that uh, we didn't we would not have that knowledge. That's where we, we rely on local contractors to have that and engineers to have that information and expertise. So that just changes the footings on the dryer on the cyclones. That kind of information so what our what would happen then is our project manager would help coordinate and and check in and make sure that is all ready our our components would be shipped and then we would have an assembly team on site that would help uh assemble that whole process and get the, get stand up the dryer and at that time once the dryer is stood up and ready to go then we will um uh, we have a, a commissioning uh, component where dryer a, a burner tech will come out and a couple of gentlemen from IEC will be on site to to oversee to, to, to dial into the dryer if you will and nothing gets dried at this point it, a lot of people get excited when they see this fire up and like oh I can go harvest and it's not that easy what we do is uh, we want to to ensure that the dryer is going to work in the right parameters and performance like like we promise and so we have a it's a, a, sh a short period where we will diagnose and, and and make sure that dryer is all dialed in and then um, after that, we will do training on site. We have a crew that comes through and helps train your staff. And what we like to do is to have at least two or three of your key members uh, on site uh, that we can train with. And what we do in that training process, we, we go over the basics of the drying process, uh, the way we conduct ourselves with this dryer and some of the key things to look at. And, um, and speaking to that, next week, we actually have some engineers that are gonna be in and giving a webinar about uh, greater detail on those dryer components and do the training so something to circle back on and check out next week but um, once that is done once we've got the training we work with you then we'll start drying hemp and we will be on site and, and help to bring you up to speed and and get you acclimated with the system and it's it's a there's a learning curve with this like any new device I mean you just don't throw the keys to someone with with a Ferrari and say go get them teenager <laughs> you've got to you got to bring these people up and 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 train them a bit and so we stay on site to help with that uh, and we make sure that we can get you trained up and then uh, once that is going you've got ownership of the dryer and now the world is your oyster go out there and dry him and then yeah and that's like Drew said we want to um, try to help people succeed and part of that is you know helping you learn how to run your machine um, and helping you understand this is you know, part of the supply chain. So you need to, as Drew said, be thinking about your harvest all the way through so that you can really get the efficiencies that you want out of the dryer. Absolutely right. You can see this, this slide deck right now is, has been available on our, uh, all of our pages here. You can see it actually, I think it's on a web page where you can find our slide deck, but you can reach to us in any of the social media. That's how uh, a lot of you probably got to our, in our webinar today. So. Uh, I definitely check that out and we, we posted the entire discussion we had last week is available also also on our uh, I think our YouTube page and links to it from our social media uh, today's session will be included in that as well and then we're looking at breaking apart some of this information into smaller bites that we can share easily and you can digest so you don't have to sit down for a full hour or two to watch this you can actually learn highlights of each discussion so that's you look for that in the, in the future so with that, that, that completes the, thank you. That completes the, the PowerPoint portion of that. Um, let's see here. You want to pull up that video, Jen. Now this, this is where typically I, you, I would have met with you and we'd be standing in front of a dryer. And what we're going to do is we're going to walk through the, basically how hemp flows through the dryer system. 
and typically we'd, we'd be either running it or at least turn it on and you can see how, it's, how it works and, and watch the process a little bit. Even though we're out of season, you don't have hemp to put through the dryer at the moment. We at least show you the process and what's involved. So what I did this time is I've created, um, we created this video that's trying to show us the, an empty dry, uh, component and then splice it with a, with a version of when it's working so you can get a feel for how hemp is processed and works through our dryer. <clears throat> So if you'd like to go ahead, Jen, and, and hit that, and we'll, I'll, I'll do my best to talk about this. That's our 6,000 that's inside a, one building. It's a huge, huge building. This is our walk around tour. First up is our metered feed hopper. And fresh hemp brought out of the field that's harvested would be used as skid steer and put into this hopper and you can see the, the low end that uh, you drop the uh, fresh harvested material in and then you see this screw auger that is metered it's real it's real precise in getting out the right biomass it, it's critical to have the to get your capacity it's critical to have the exact amount of biomass going in at all times and that drops onto a conveyor and this conveyor moves it's a, a chevron cleated belt and it moves very quickly and it, it introduces the hemp into the the lift tube or the j tube which is the start of the flash dryer. And now this here is actually the, the, the you see the screw auger, and I apologize that the video it seems a little bit clunky. It might be on your internet speeds, but we'll post this video tomorrow so you can see that as well, so you can play it back. Um, you can see fresh hemp is going in, and then you can see the belt is really full of hemp and it's moving at a really quick pace. If you wanna pause there for a second, Jen. It's critical to have that, uh, Thank you. It's critical to have that that, um, that belt maintain a fresh ribbon of hemp going through. That's how you get your capacities up. If you see an empty space on that that belt, that's lost capacity, and we stress that because we want to achieve and dry as much hemp as possible. And the way you do that is continuously feeding hemp into that dryer. The dryer can run simple components can run all day. Uh, the, the key to getting and drying a lot of hemp quickly is to always maintain a, a constant ribbon of hemp. And that's what that goal is to have a nice even flow continually going into the dryer. And so as you see here, this is the, the dryer. This is our uh, flash bed dryer. And what you're seeing here in the light blue, right in the foreground, is actually the burner component. That's where we saw that flame, that blue white flame that I said looked like an F-14, the Tomcat <laughs> uh, of the afterburners. That's where the heat is. And then you see the portholes all the way around. There's, I think, a total of six or eight uh, portholes uh, around the, the cylinder. That is where we draw air through. But remember, this is an induction fan that's pulling, drawing air through the system. So air is being pulled through, introduced to the flame, and brought, and then that heat source, and is brought indirectly into the J-tube. So it bends and goes up. And that's where our hemp and the, um, and this warm air are introduced to each other. And it's at that point is where our flash drying starts. Go ahead, Jen, if you want to hit start on that. There's our lift tube. You can see how it transitions to vertical. And right there, if you could pause, oh, perfect, Jen, thank you. And you maybe highlight that with the cursor. You can see the, the conveyor belt and then right where the cursor is going around, you can see that's that's where the our hemp is inputted into the flash furnace part. And this is where the flashing actually happens is in this little spot right here. And then what makes the, this is where we hit it with a, with a, a, a high heat, but for a brief, brief second, a split second time. And for the remainder of that second, we have air traveling through this ductwork at 40 miles an hour. That's important, to 40, 45 miles an hour. It's important to remember the volume of air that's moving through here. And so immediately as, as our fresh, wet ambient air temperature hemp hits at say 70% moisture, it's meeting this really, really warm air and it's being, that warm air is being quenched immediately. And so what it does is the air following uh, on through the rest of the tube is actually continually to lose its heat, dissipate heat, because it's drawing the moisture out of the, the hemp. And so, while we hit it with a high temperature right here at the beginning for a split second, the remaining second, and it's, I know it's a challenge to realize, we're looking at over 100 feet of ductwork that it rattles through, and that is makes up the rest part of the component of the flash dryer. So it's in that remaining second 
we take all that moisture out. So we reduce 40% uh, of the moisture of your hemp is we knocked out in this one second blast. It's pretty amazing. So go ahead, Jen, if you would, please. And this is very quickly, you can see ductwork. This is a, plays into our, our ability to uh, be real flexible in design. That ductwork can uh, reconfigure quickly in any place. And this is inside the dryer. You can see the air is moving pulled. Through. You can see the some of the insulation inside the furnace itself is moving around a little bit. That shows you that indicates the volume of air being pulled through. And then the flash dryer cyclone. That uh, what we're seeing in that component that I touched on before is your your Dyson vacuum cleaner uh, gadgetry. <laughs> They'll have you think. Uh, what you have here is we separate that warm air that we just pulled and all that moisture we just pulled out of the biomass is now being separated. So our our 40% less moisture content hemp is being dropped in that cyclone. Go ahead, Jen, if you'd want. And you'll see here at the bottom is an airlock. See that, that yellow band? Uh, that's the gears for that. That's an airlock that drops the solids out, maintains that uh, vacuum inside the cyclone. And here you can see the hemp actually being pulled through as it's going up and it's going to go into the fluid bed. So now the fluid bed, pause there for a second, Jen. The fluid bed, we'll see here in this video, is um, we're gonna look inside it. And again, the resolution may not allow you to look and see it, but in the, you'll see, note, you'll see a, um, the perforated floor of that, that bed where the hemp comes in. That's where the warm air is circulating underneath. And that's brought to you by the fluid bed furnace. And, and it's where the rest of the hemp will finish out here. This is where it gets to the less than 10% moisture content is in this process. And again, we're looking from start to finish around 90 seconds. So go ahead, Jen, if you would, please. There you're looking into the fluid bed. I know that's a tough shot to see, but it'll be revealed here in a bit. You see it's a cylinder. Uh, the reason for that is fluid dynamics allows you to, to circulate air quickly and efficiently, no corners for stuff to get caught in. You can see there in the background, you'll see the blower motor for the fluid bed. And now here you'll see this hemp, this is exactly what we were looking at previously is that that hemp is moving like a swarm of bees. It's being suspended in air and dried on all sides. And that's really the the critical detail in our, our dryer is that we, we, we dry on all sides with a very high volume of really warm air. So that it really helps dry that very quickly and efficiently. And then on to the next slide, uh, part, if you would, Jen, on the fluid bed. And now here, there you can see the airlock again from the, we're underneath that cyclone. And then the cyclone and this version of this dryer, we have a pneumatic, or I mean, conveyor system that could, uh, conveys it out and then you can see here it climbs and then we have a way to sort and right there you'd have super sacks or, or a, a plastic tote in place that would allow us to drop uh, dried hemp. And what happens in that area is um, you can see because it's, it's dried quickly that we do have some dust in that area and so one of the things we'll address here in a bit is some of the, the changes that we made in that area and I'll address that in a bit. Um, Next is a MCC, a PLC, and I don't have a spot on this and that, and the reason I don't have it in our flow chart here is because that, that component can be placed in a variety of places where it makes sense, best use for you. A lot of times people will place this component because it's a key component to the start of the dryer. A lot of times they'll place that at the front by the metered feed hopper knowing that's the business end as far as getting stuff into the dryer. So if you'd like, Jen, go ahead and hit play on that, please. You're looking at the, the 15 inch touch screen. That, if you want to pause that for a second, Jen. What you'll see here is you can see the animations on that screen. There you go, thank you. Um, yeah, that indicates that the, everything is working as, as expected and normal. If those were, you see those icons would change if they were not working right. If you can see something, if there's an issue that needs to be addressed, we have a, a variety of stale faces in place. Sale, uh, can you speak? <laughs> Fail sale in place rather that that can uh, will trip if, if in the event of anything uh, out of ordinary happening uh, you can see the fans are rotating and uh, burners are lit and you, that's indicated by the icons in that and then you can also see the set temperatures 
you can see the in this case um, if you look uh, at the uh, start of this this looks like this video was actually shot as a dryer was coming up to temperature and depending on the ambient air temperature the dryer could be uh, if it's a warm day it could be ready to go in about five minutes time uh, if it's a outdoors or if it's a uh, you got a colder ambient temperature like so people are drying late into uh, even December because of the wet season we had here in the Midwest um, that changes the parameter you'd want to warm that it's gonna take a little longer to warm that up because you're warming all that steel up as well but what you're seeing here is the temperatures are the furnaces and then we, we monitor actually we don't worry too much about the furnace temperatures we're actually worried about the air as it's in the cyclone because that's where your biomass is and so we maintain that temperature is what we maintain. And, and what happens depending on the biomass coming into our dryer system, that's where the furnace will fluctuate in, in um, heat to, to create and keep that constant temperature that we find in the cyclones up at the top. Of, of right here we have an uh, output of 250 and then 162. That's just the air temperature, that's not the biomass temperature. So um, on to the next one, please, Jen, or a little bit forward. Perfect. This is the next screen, another screen in our, our, our touch screen with our uh, MCC this is our motor control center. And what's important here, this allows you the flexibility and your, you can dial in and what it, you can do is you can adjust all the different uh, speeds of all the components in the dryer system. You can look at it, you can set start speeds. Uh, it's key and we'll, we'll talk about the, the importance of the VFDs in a minute, but we have start speeds uh, and then where we get up to the percentage we want to when we're actually running the dryer system itself. And then you can see the bright yellow buttons are ethernet uh, IP. What that means, and it's important, is that we have our dryers are connected to the internet. And that allows us as, as you're never left alone when you're running your dryer. We have the ability to remote in and look at diagnostics of your dryer system at any time. And so we can, and we also track temperatures you're running and the span speeds you're running. So we, we can get a snapshot of your system at any time. And then what is really neat is that we have that access to all our dryers. So say, say if you're in a specific region and you were drying up beautifully for the last five days and now day six, all of a sudden you're not getting the results you want. You really can't figure out why that is. Uh, we could remote in very quickly in a matter of minutes, take a look at and, and see where your parameters were set previously and where they're at now and to make adjustments and then just as important we can actually look at data from other dryers in in the multi-state region and, and they're experiencing the same weather phenomenon or something we can make those adjustments so you can see that so you're never left out on your cold out in the cold because of this internet access we have the ability to quickly diagnose and troubleshoot anything that's going on with you in a matter of minutes versus being down for a, a day or two as we try to get a personnel out to you so I couldn't stress the importance of this uh, this feature this is a, a really big time saver and a money saver for people and it keeps our dryers uh, running optimally and up to full efficiency on to the next slide there would you Jen or forward our video I guess I should say <laughs> all right this this is the control panel itself it, pause that if you could please thank you um, what's important about this is you can see the components it's all in a very very sealed box uh, on the front of that is where that touch screen that you just saw and you're on the upper left on the door that's open you actually is the back side of that touch screen but what's key about this component tree is like i said all the electronics that we have on the dryer system all are under a variable start or variable frequency drive vfds and that's a very big deal is what i would say what that allows you to do and why it's so important it allows us to infinite control of the electronics on the dryer system but this is importantly because we're using the, a large amount of electricity we use like I said a 443 phase electricity we don't hit your local utility with a sudden surge poof, boom on and draw all that and your neighbors aren't gonna have brownouts <laughs> they'll appreciate this and we also get a credit from local utilities because of these VFDs we're not when we first turn the dryer on we're not pulling as much electricity at once as needed so it slowly ramps up so the the ability of this and unique features of this is that we have that kind of control which is really slick so um we soft start like the fans it's not like a flip the switch and boom you're going to 40 miles an hour it's it you ramp up into that and you'll see that as we go forward thanks jen
Next. All right, this is just as cool as the other electronic components. And this is the thing I don't see in any of our comp competition besides the ability to remote in and have that, that access and to help uh, troubleshoot uh, with any things that's going on in your drying situation. Just as cool, and we have to have access to this as well as your operators, is we have a video surveillance system on the entire dryer. And what is really neat about this is not only do we, this is a like a 32 inch flat screen that's above that uh, MCC PLC component. And so you're, if you're an operator, you can look at that and you can see it immediately live. You can see what's going on inside your dryer at any one time. And just as important as this is, anyone that has a smartphone, you have the ability to access this video as well. So you can actually see what's going on. And now what I'll talk about here are each of these components, and it's really obvious here in this, at least for my screen, is the biggest picture you see here is a circle, and it looks kind of like, a, like an old school coffee machine. You can see all the holes in that. You're looking, at the, you're looking from the top down on the fluid bed. And you can see now, I was talking about all those little holes, that is where air is circulating and, and suspending the hemp as it enters this, the um, uh, fluid bed. So we can, you have a live feed always monitoring the fluid bed so you can see exactly what the fluid bed looks like. In the upper right corner, you're looking at a video that's looking right at the burner for the fluid bed burner. Or excuse me, that is probably, and these are variable, that is actually probably for the uh, flash dryer. So you can look at the flame and make sure that you're getting the correct flame and it looks and works correctly and you didn't have a, uh, any issues with the flame. Below that is actually the input feed hopper and, and the conveyor belt that goes into the J-type, J-tube. So you can look at that and make sure that the hemp is flowing in as expected and there's nothing uh, causing any uh, clogs or anything like that. That's the key is having a, a homogenous uh, biomass is the fact that you want to have particle size uniform. And if you, if you have that variance, like we were seeing last year with people are full drying, uh, you saw all, all over the place, you would have some issues in that, in that space. But that's why we have that camera there. Below that, directly below that, the other circle is obviously the other, uh, you're looking at the other furnace for the fluid bed. Uh, to, and working our way to the left, in the middle of the le lower left, that's the output auger or hopper in this case. And you can see the conveyor as it's pushing the amp out. So you can see and keep an eye on super sacks as they fill and they do fill pretty quick. You keep an eye on that so you can uh, change out the sacks and, and, and keep keep moving right along. We don't, we don't stop with super sacks, changing them out. You flip flop the, the uh, device there so we can keep filling bag after bag after bag. It just goes, goes, goes. And then just as critical, the whole system is that lower left corner. You'll see that's looking down on the uh, input feed hopper. And you could actually see the, the screw auger at the bottom as it would meter hemp out into the conveyor belt. And so that's critical there too, because obviously you want to keep running full capacity around the clock while it's harvest time. And that allows you to see that all the time. And like I said, all of this is available with an app on your phone that you can look at this. So any operator anywhere on the dryer can have access to looking at all of these components in the dryer in real time. I, I think it's pretty, nothing short of amazing. It looks and works really well. It's a valuable tool. And then we also have access because it's, it's a network. Uh, we have access to this as well. So when we are, if you're experiencing any kind of mechanical issue or, or performance issue, one of our technicians can look at this feed and, and troubleshoot and diagnose this immediately without having to be in, on person or on site and in person uh, to diagnose these things. So it's huge, a huge saver in, in, in time and money on both ends. Uh, us having to be there and, and keeping you up and running full speed. Uh, go ahead, Jen, to the next. All right. Well, I know I was windy, <laughs> but that brings us to our question answer time. Uh, I tried my best to, to show you what the components would be like. Like I said, typically we'd be live and we'd walk around and have more time to discuss each component and might have moved over some things too quick for you. And that's why we're offering this opportunity here to answer any questions. So uh, Jen, if you want to moderate that for us, that would be great. Yes, definitely. So um, the first question we have is from Scott. Um, it says, the biomass in this presentation looks very clean and stem free. What is the labor component of prepping product for drying? I know Matthew talked on that a little bit earlier, but maybe we can talk yeah. a little bit. Yeah, you want to start with that, Matthew? 
Yeah, I, you know, obviously uh, folks are harvesting in a lot of different ways. You know, from our experience, and we talked a lot about this in our presentation last week, if you're doing more than a couple acres, you really need to be looking at large-scale harvesting equipment. Um, and what we've really found over time is that, uh, again, go back to the capacity, anything you can remove in the field that you don't want to dry, uh, like excessive stock material, um, is really a good thing. So um, we're finding a lot of people are having success using some kind of a modified combine to get a lot of that stock material out in the field, still chop the flower material. Um, and that's what I think you're probably seeing in those videos. So I, I realized, Jen, I, one thing I, I, I wanted to mention after the end of that video is um, what you there was a dryer that was uh, installed in 2019. Moving forward for 2020, we actually have some new updated equipment I wanted to discuss real quick. And that is, um, uh, after the, we saw of such a variety, our specs were requiring a four mesh, discrete free flowing biomass or hemp. And uh, a lot of times when we train the, the customers who buy our dryers, they were able to get that or achieve that. But when they started to toll dry for other farmers, and this is important to realize what we talk about with toll drying, toll drying, is, is actually drying your friend's hemp as well. And that is a, a great revenue uh, builder for you. And, and it's got a, uh, a key critical component to making friends <laughs> with your farmers. Um, what you wanna do there is we found that while you might have it dialed in and be able to harvest your hemp and get it in the correct spec and work really well, your friends may not. And so we're seeing a wide variety of hemp being harvested, at, like Matthew touched on, a variety of ways that it's getting done. Um, we saw some people hand buck and, and go to the labor of chopping and stuff in the fields by hand and, and bringing it on uh, wagons or hay racks and, and feeding it through a, a combine or something to that effect. Or you see bales come in and the way it was baled it, and harvested, it might have been uh, with a forage chopper or uh, sometimes with a combine or there's other kinds of components. There's, there's a variety of ways that uh, hemp is being harvested. But the key is we want it to be homogenized in the right size. And so seeing the wide variety of hemp that harvested like it was last year, we enter, this year we're introducing a hammer mill that's got a specially designed uh, screen that we worked with and R&D with this year that really impressed with the way it be, creates uh, a, a, the correct flow and sizing of our biomass. And it really does nothing more than just kind of help fluff it up a little bit and make sure we don't have any large pieces so we, everything can dry very efficiently and, and, and quickly and smoothly in our dryer. So one of the components we added then is the hammer mill. Another important consideration, and, and you've got to realize this, and we're talking dryers and our competitors are, are also dryer people, um, uh, fires. Fires are, are a fact of life. Uh, we we want to avoid fires at all costs. And what we have here with our dryer system, we are incorporating a um, fire suppression system for the fluid bed uh, component. And what that does is it, it's constantly monitoring for an ignition source and it will suppress that ignition immediately when it sees that ignition source happen if it's to happen inside the dryer. Now, uh, when I look at the competitors and see what's going on with their stuff, and they too can, you can, fires are definitely a concern. Um, typically with the, the way those technology, other technologies work uh, with a box conveyor belt system, you have a dwell time of a large amount of biomass. It could be 15, 20 minutes inside this large box. So you got, a, you got hemp in a variety of, of stages of drying, if you will, through this whole process if you were to have a fire event in there, what do you think is gonna to happen to the rest of that biomass that's in that box? You're gonna, you're gonna lose all of it and it's all gonna probably catch, it becomes a combustion source and can build a fire. The same will go on with the um, rotary dryer folks. I know they use lifters to help bring and tumble dry. It's kind of like a closed dryer in that regard. It, they constantly circulating the biomass into the airstream. That's why what we do with our airstream is so important. They do the same kind of thing, but it's constantly being tumbled and it, uh, those lifters can, can clog. And if they have a fire event, they also have a long dwell time with their, their hemp inside that, that rotary dryer. And so you have, you could, again, could have a large fire situation because you have such a large variety of hemp in that bio, amount of biomass inside that rotary dryer. Now what's unique about our system is because we move hemp so quickly in that fluid bed, we have 
at most probably 100 pounds of, of biomass that's in that fluid bed at any one time, and it's quickly moving out. In the event of a fire, suppression system kicks in, drops that immediately, and it's all contained in a steel, a very heavy gauge steel uh, fluid bed. So in the event of a fire, we knock that fire, it would be knocked out immediately, and you're, you only have a combustion source of maybe only 100 pounds at most compared to the other two competing versions of dryers, which literally could be thousands of pounds at, at one time. So I, that's one thing that uh, we added this year. And then um, as you saw in the dryer, at the back end of the dryer, we uh, had conveyor belts that were moving out hemp. This year we're adding a pneumatic conveyor system. And what that does is it, that keeps uh, a lot of the, the dust and other components down and it, it moves it more, it's just easier and quicker to move uh, hemp as it's coming out of the dryer. And then what that does is that will go into a little itty bitty cyclone that's, that cycles that out and it goes right into super sacks or totes just like uh, we've seen that. I would have had uh, our engineering drawings just got completed so I didn't have a chance to add that to our presentation to show some of that components. But look for videos in the near future that will highlight our testing with the hammer mill. And as soon as we have the video available to show you the pneumatic uh, conveyor system, we would include that as well. So. That's just a couple of things I wanted to touch on going forward with this year's dryer system. Um, like we said earlier on, we had this is our third uh, generation dryer. We started in 2015 with a purpose built dryer just for hemp. This design is specifically for hemp. And every year, anytime we make any kind of uh, improvements or updates, we want they're backward compatible. We extend that and offer that to. Um, uh, the availability for purchase that other people have brought our dryer in the past can update things. We offer, because we have the internet, access to the software and all the components that we have that we see, we update our software quite often. And, and, that's, and as long as we have internet access to our dryer systems like we do, we can push new updates and interfaces. We're looking at doing it again. There's going to be an update for 2020 and you'll see some, uh, some new parameters in and a variety of uh, the look and feel of that touchscreen will come in place too. So um, if you purchase with us, it's not like a one-time deal. We're going to drop it off. Wish you luck, buddy, and go get them. It's, it's, it, you're, you're in the family, and we're going to work with you and, and always be there to support you. And we have the ability to support you in a very quick and timely manner. So I think it's important to talk about our service on that end. And that's it. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Drew. Um, Okay, we have another question from Mark. Are these units marketed mainly to individual growers or common slash public dryer operations or both? Uh, good question. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, and actually both. What we're seeing quite a bit is those who have the means to purchase one of these dryers will quickly become a center for education too. Um, a lot of people were excited about hemp, and like I mentioned, the five states that I know of that are all getting in for the first time this year, uh, there's going to be a lot of enthusiasm and, and an opportunity to educate those people. And what happens is when you purchase a dryer, there'll be a lot of people who will, are, are uh, testing the waters, if you will, we're growing a one, two, three, four, five, ten acre plots, and, and they need a, a system or way to dry. And so you'll become their best friend and you'll be on the Christmas card <laughs> mailing list in short order because you'll like to have them, uh, you'll be able to toll dry for them. And so you'll see uh, uh, co-ops can be created and you'll see um, that revenue uh, on a toll drying is great. Uh, typically they, they measure um, and get paid based on the wet pounds per, uh, per drying as they dry hemp. And that, that price anywhere from like two and a quarter to three bucks a wet pound is what you see. Uh, it varies on some inputs, but um, it, it can be uh, advantageous to set up a dryer and to toll dry for your, your local farmers. And that education aspect, a lot of people then see that you're committed to, to seriously drying hemp and are in this game for the long run. And so you'll see uh, the opportunity to help them, uh, your fellow farmers understand the importance of drying. Uh, so we see, uh, we do see individual farmers who buy them and, and like I say, they, they, it quickly becomes a, almost a co-op. And then we have large facilities and quite a few that are set up just to offer that service where they actually will, um, you might be contracted to grow hemp for someone and then they will have a, the, the drying process and they can dry it and then they in turn will do the extraction usually all on site at the same place 
or they can store it for you as well. That's another aspect of this process is once us hemp's dried, it's now in a, and it's, it's a stable biomass. It's got a shelf life now, so it can be extracted at a further notice or be shipped easily and readily to any extractor nationwide via flatbed truck or whatever. So good, good question. Great, thank you, Drew. Um, next question is, what is the efficiency or the amount of energy per unit moisture removed? Um, well, Drew kind of showed a few of the uh, <clears throat> gas efficiencies. I'd say we roughly estimate, I mean, utility costs about 25 cents per dried pound. You know, there's some variables whether you have propane or natural gas. You yeah. uh, know, that's kind of a rough estimate you can use to think about utility costs for drying. What I, what I tell customers is typically to dry, uh, using a 3,000, and you can just extrapolate that, double it for six and times five for the 15,000. Um, the, the amount of gas and electricity used per hour is uh, for 3,000 is about 50 bucks. And then you add your labor costs on that. So a crew of four maybe, and whatever you, you're paying your staff, that's your operating costs to operate the dryer. And so when you're toll drying, this is where it gets interesting. When you're toll drying, if you can toll dry 3,000 wet pounds an hour and you're charging whatever price you're charging, you can do the math and figure out what, what kind of a return on investment you can get, get there. So it's, it's important to realize that opportunity. Thank you. That good question. All right, we have two more questions. Um, another one from Mike. What is the typical CBD loss in your dryer compared to other dryers? Uh, great question, Matthew. You you touched on that a little bit. You would like to speak about that at all? Yeah, I mean, we you know typically in hang drying you see loss of about a point. Um, I think our dryer is very similar to that. We haven't really seen much more uh, than a loss of about a point in CBD. And that's pretty consistent with what you're going to see in hang drying or any kind of drying process. Yep. Uh, we also just got some really exciting results back that kind of show that our, our process does retain terps, terpenes within there. I mean, obviously a certain amount are going to be burnt off, but, um, but we actually retain a fair amount because of the uh, quickness of the process, I think. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, Anonymous asks, how long does it take from order to installation? It's a great question. Yeah, I mean, typically we will uh, ship all the equipment within 12 to 14 weeks from the date of deposit. Um, assembly usually on our side, uh, getting it up in the air is about uh, 10 days to two weeks, depending on the size. Then however long it takes to get those utility connections together. Um, so, you know, somewhere in the four to five month project range. And that's a good thing to remember, you know, um, we are definitely getting into that time of the year you want to be making these kinds of decisions. We know people are obviously focused on important things like getting genetics and getting things in the ground, um, but it certainly sneaks up on people uh, when it comes to uh, how they're going to dry and have those solutions. And I think that's why Drew, you know, sort of touched on why you become so popular as a toll dryer because we talk to people all the time that have even a 10 acre uh, which they thought was somewhat conservative, but after about two acres, they realize they're in a lot of trouble uh, and that they're probably going to lose it if they don't get some help getting it down quickly. So, so yeah. Um, and yeah, somebody did mention something about efficiency at the uh, air temperatures. That's something we definitely have learned over time. Um, if you're going to put the dryer outside, it's going to make a difference. If you're going to dry in November in cold temperatures, it's gonna make a difference on the outputs. Um, so those are things to consider when you're thinking about how we design it. And, and we're certainly happy to share what we've learned from our own experiences. Yep. Great, thanks Matthew. And then Mike, you're again, has a great question. Can we contact someone to discuss prices and installation costs? And I would just say, um, you can con yep, go for it Matthew, you can share. Yeah, I'd say we, any of us would be happy to talk with you, but uh, I think, you know, we'll, um, if you want to send an email over to our info at uh, iccompanies.com, we can definitely get you uh, hooked up with uh, Sean or Drew or one of us. We'll definitely talk to you soon. Absolutely. Perfect. And that is all the questions that we have had today.
Um, so thank you, Drew and Matthew. Thanks everybody for listening and learning about our dryers today. Um, again, we'll get this out on YouTube. So if you want to share it with anybody, um, you're more than welcome to do that. And yeah, Drew and Matthew, any closing remarks? Yeah, actually, uh, check our website out. Uh, we have a FAQ that is, if you had some questions you didn't get answered or, or think of later, uh, after you look at the PowerPoint slides, that's there as well. Go ahead and look at that. We have a, it's really in depth and really great resource for some answers that might just not pertain to our dryer, but to drying in, in, in general. So I'd encourage you to look at that. And don't forget about our webinar last week that touched us on dryer basics and the reason, the importance of drying hemp. And then going forward next week, we have um, our, our more of a technical team uh, is going to be on board and then we'll go a little more in depth about the techniques and used and, and the way our, our uh, PLC and MCC integrate and work. So it's important to, to get a little better insight as to how things were, we, how we dry the hemp and, and it's more of a hands-on, it was hands-on as you can be short of being in front of a dryer that uh, you can get. So I'd certainly encourage you to check out next week. So we do webinar Wednesdays is what we're we're, we're doing going forward. Yeah, thanks. Check out our YouTube page. We're going to keep adding more content and uh, we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, thanks everybody. Sarah. Have a good one, guys. Thank you, Stay guys. safe. Have a great day.